Oh. Oh, I got it. Okay. No. No. Good evening, everyone. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you. I'm Philip Arnold, uh, the chair of the religion department, uh, faculty in Native American studies, and the director of the Scano Great Law Peace Center at Onondaga Lake. The Borg Ignoni lecture series continues to be instrumental in enabling the religion department to bring greater attention to the study of American Catholicism on the campus of Syracuse University. One person on the USU faculty who uh, is already doing so through her books and articles and also her lectures and teaching is Professor Margaret Thompson. Peggy Thompson teaches in the history department. Yes. Fellow of the Campbell Institute and has a courtesy appointment in the Department of Religion. Much of her research has been focused on studying the contributions of the Catholic Sisters in American history and politics. We are grateful that Professor Thompson agreed to chair the fac faculty advisory committee for the Borgognoni lecture series, and I invite her to come up now and introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Peggy. Thanks, Phil, and for those of you who are really in the know, you will notice that I am wearing a skirt of IHM blue. <laughs> yes, that was intentional. I am delighted to introduce Sister Sandra Schneiders. Many of you are familiar with her work. Sister Sandra has been a member of the Sisters Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary of Monroe, Michigan for Midge more than 60 years. She had her jubilee last summer. And she has been a professor of spirituality and theology at the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley, the Graduate Theological Union. And uh, she has been involved in their Center for Spirituality and Worship. I could list awards. I could list publications. I could list all kinds of honors. But I wanted to begin by telling you the story of how I met Sandra. One of the great privileges of my life was to work on the sesquicentennial history of the Sister Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary of Monroe, Michigan. It was an intentionally feminist project that was written by a feminist collective. And I was invited in because there weren't any historians in the group that was working on it. I had absolutely nothing to contribute, but I learned a great deal and fell in love with the congregation and with many of its members. When the book finally came out, published incidentally by Syracuse University Press, the, um, at community days, they set all the authors around a big circle at tables so that people could go around and get their book signed by all of the authors. And I was asked to do that as well because I wrote the introduction. And People are coming by, and they're all these sisters I don't know. And I'm going, oh, thank you, sister, and signing things. And thank you, sister, signing things. And then all of a sudden, I hear this voice say, would you please sign my book? Oh, thank you, sister. You're Sandra Schneiders. <laughs> Sandra is a brilliant scholar, a fine writer, a woman of great wisdom. But I would simply like to mention the fact and, and, and acknowledge the fact she's also one of the most intellectually generous people I have ever met. If I write something and it's published, Sandra is inevitably among the first one or two people I hear from with affirmation and feedback and enthusiasm and support. It's really remarkable that someone so busy and so renowned would take the time for somebody like me and to thank me for whatever little thing I've done. So she is a, a woman of great intellectual generosity and great spirituality. I wanted to read a couple of passages of hers that I found uh, when she talks about her own writing and her own career as a scholar. She says, the motivation to write comes primarily from the reception of my work by the people for whom it is written. The service my writing offers to many people makes the work involved very worthwhile. 
Writing for an academic is always an exercise in ingenuity because writing is, on the one hand, expected, and on the other hand, not factored into the scheduled responsibilities the scholar is assigned, with, assigned to within the institution. One learns to write in the cracks of time and in spurts. I have found that I spend considerable time reflecting on topics in which I'm interested before I even begin an outline, so that by the time I actually begin to write, I am deeply involved intellectually and affectively in the material. That is a major incentive and driving force for the work. In the final analysis, I suppose people write who find it worthwhile and find that they do it effectively. I think that's the case for me. I think that you will find that tonight. I'm delighted to introduce Sandra, but before I do, <laughs> her title of her talk tonight is What Are the Nuns Really Up To? And I'm sure we all want the answer to that question. But I would be delighted to announce to you as well that we have a person who has accepted the invitation to be the Bergignoni speaker for 2017. And the speaker for 2017 is Kaya Oakes. Some of you may be familiar with her work. She is the author of a memoir called, it was on the back until I moved the pages. See? There she is. She is the author of Radical Reinvention, An Unlikely Return to the Catholic Church, and The Nuns Are All Right, N-O-N-E-S, A New Generation of Believers, Seekers, and Those in Between on Millennial Spirituality. So we are happy to go from The Nuns, N-U-N-S, to The Nuns, N-O-N-E-S, next year. And we hope you'll join us then. In the meantime, I'm delighted to introduce Sister Sandra Schneiders. Good evening. Just a minute while I get wired here. Okay. All right, is this working? Yes. Yes. Great. Unfortunately, so is this, and we're going to get through that. <laughs> Anyone who fools around with academics has to put up with this. <laughs> How many academics does it take to turn on a microphone? <laughs> Whole room full sometimes. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here. Thank you, Peggy. And thank you for the invitation to deliver this year's Borgognoni Lecture. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you for this annual discussion, I'm told, of some topic pertinent to current experience in the Catholic Church. When I asked Dr. Thompson what kind of topic might be of interest to this group, she suggested something on U.S. women religious, often called nuns. In light of the Second Vatican Council, and especially in the last few years, since I both belong to the cohort of the subject, and have spent a good deal of the energy and time in my theological career on the theology of religious life, I'm happy to reflect with you on this phenomenon, which I have discovered is of interest to non-Catholics as well as Catholics. I don't want to spend too much time on the recent investigations of U.S. women religious by the Vatican, which gave us a considerable amount of free publicity. <laughs> Unless that's something that you're really interested in and want to... Uh, discussed during the question period. Suffice it to say that the Vatican, through two of the offices of its central administration, called the Curia, initiated two investigations of U.S. women religious in the first decade of the century. In 2008, the Vatican office charged with oversight of religious in the church, that office is called the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life. The Vatican is anything but brief. <laughs> they began what is called an apostolic visitation, which in this case was essentially an investigation of all the non-cloistered congregations of women religious in the United States, nearly 400 orders. 
That investigation ended in 2012, and a final report was issued in 2014, which in effect exonerated the congregations, the religious, of the implied and the explicit charges against them, which had given rise to the investigation. In 2009, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the church's guardian of doctrinal purity, announced its intention, implemented between 2012 and 2015, to investigate the doctrinal purity of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. You've probably heard it called the LCWR. LCWR is the organization of the leaders, or presidents, of about 80% of women's orders in this country. That investigation ended somewhat ambiguously, but it seems clear that for the foreseeable future, there will be no further unpleasantness from that quarter. <laughs> In other words, between 2008 and 2015, the Vatican's highest offices conducted unilateral, accusation-driven investigations of both the leadership and the membership of US women's religious congregations. No one knowledgeable on the subject doubted that both investigations were spurred by right-wing vigilantes in the hierarchy and among the laity, who believed the Catholic sisters had run amok in both faith and practice, that they needed to be reined in. Their behavior was particularly worrisome to self-appointed guardians of the faith who feared the influence of the US sisters, who have considerable credibility among the laity and among women religious in some developing countries who were more well-behaved and might be perverted by <laughs> contact with us. Although both investigations ended with face-saving protestations of the underlying goodwill and positive intentions of the investigators, and on the other hand, the relief of the sisters that all had ended without serious damage to their congregations, their members, their leadership, or their ministries, Few doubted that the advent of Pope Francis had more than a little to do with both the closing of the investigations and the essential exoneration of the sisters. Painful as the experience of being unjustly suspected, accused, and assaulted in the church they loved and served, and by the officials of that institution, the fallout from these events has already been remarkably positive in ways certainly not intended by their instigators nor expected or foreseen by the sisters. For one thing, the press coverage, both religious and secular, of the investigations thrust American women religious, usually referred to as nuns, N-U-N-S, into the public spotlight, both in the church and in secular society, in a way that has probably never been the case in modern times, and certainly not in this country, which was religiously Protestant from its foundation, and in which Catholics only emerged fully into public life after the election of John F. Kennedy as the first Catholic president in 1960. For one thing, most rank and file Catholics, the majority of whom had been taught, nursed, spiritually guided, counseled, socially supported, or otherwise cared for by sisters at some point in their lives, rose up during the investigations in very vocal support of the sisters. Many of them had gotten to know sisters in an even more familiar and intimate way as sisters played larger roles in parishes and social justice work in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council. And the council, of course, closed in 1965. It became clear to all that the brand of women religious in this country among Catholics and non-Catholics alike was very strong, indeed quite a bit stronger than that of the hierarchy. And this positive attitude toward sisters has been empirically underlined most recently by a very wide-ranging study of Americans' attitudes toward Catholic sisters, underwritten by the Conrad Hilton Foundation and prepared by Anderson Robbins Research. This study involved a cross-section of people, religiously affiliated and not, and of all generations from millennials, that is the 18 to 33 cohort, through the so-called silent generation, the 70 plus cohort. The survey showed that women religious are twice as likely to be viewed very favorably than Catholic priests or even the Catholic Church itself as an institution. And they are especially likely to be trusted. They rank in the same highest trust bracket with scientists and school teachers. 
some 90% of respondents across the board viewed nuns favorably. However, and this is pertinent to our discussion this evening, the actual knowledge of sisters is often meager and fairly often fact factually incorrect. And this is as true of Catholics as of non-Catholics. What people do know about religious is that they are in religious life because of their love of God and their desire to serve people, and that they can be trusted to live what they profess and do what they're committed to doing. In a very real sense, that's not a bad report card, <laughs> at least not in the present state of religious affairs in this country. But I would like to, what I'd like to do in our time together is address the other finding, namely that most people are really not very knowledgeable about sisters. Not only about the terminology that describes them, where and how they live, why they do or do not dress uniformly, how they are related to the official institutional Catholic Church, the breadth and character of their ministerial involvements, but also about the deepest meaning and commitments in their lives. In other words, as the title suggests, what nuns are really up to. So I want to talk with you this evening about the nature and meaning of Roman Catholic religious life. Not by way of defense, which we don't seem to need at the moment, <laughs> nor for purposes of recruitment or fundraising. I think you'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> We might pass the plate afterwards, but. <laughs> but to foster growth in communion based on mutual knowledge in the church among believers in all walks of life and all vocations, an understanding of this characteristically Catholic life form among people of other traditions. And some of you as parents, teachers, mentors, may be in a position to help the young adults you deal with in their discernment about their own life choices. So some of what I present and what might arise in our conversation afterward might be helpful to you. First, let me uh, lay to rest some misconceptions about what, who nuns are and what we're really up to. You notice that I use the term nuns, sisters, women, religious, interchangeably, and order, congregation, and community, interchangeably. This is not just verbal sloppiness. And the terms are not strictly synonymous. But it reflects the fact that we don't control language. These terms are being used interchangeably by journalists, ordinary people, religious themselves, and even some theologians. Canon lawyers are about the only people I know who strive to be totally correct and unfailingly consistent in their use of ecclesiastical terminology. <laughs> the rest of us speak English. <laughs> So rather than playing the linguistic purist, which just annoys people, I'll distinguish the terms for the sake of clarity and then use them more freely as they are being used in normal parlance. So just to be clear, in regard to the people we're talking about, religious is technically the broadest term and it embraces both nuns and sisters. It designates a canonically defined category, that is a category defined by canon law, of people in the church who can be female or male, but the vast majority are women. There are about, th about three-fourths of religious in the church are women. And these are the ones I'm talking about this evening, of course. Canon law does not make a person a religious, although it can help us recognize who is, in fact, a religious. A religious is a person who responds to a personal vocation that is an experienced and discerned call from God to give herself completely to God, to the exclusion of any other primary life commitment, by making and living perpetual public vows of consecrated celibacy, gospel poverty, and prophetic obedience within a recognized and approved institute or congregation in the church. The vast majority of religious live their commitment to God in a community of fellow religious. The community, canonically called an order in the case of nuns, or a congregation in the case of sisters, refers to the affective and effective social unit composed of the members. Some religious who are strictly speaking called nuns, these are 
nuns in the strict canonical sense of the word, lived their religious life in a stable monastic community called an order, which is in some way cloistered, that is sequestered at least to some degree from interaction with those outside the order. The majority of religious, however, who are usually called sisters, live religious life in mobile ministerial communities, canonically called congregations. They move about in response to ministerial needs and usually have considerable interaction with those outside their own communities. Until 1900, sisters, that is members of groups we today would call ministerial or apostolic congregations, who made simple rather than solemn vows and were not strictly cloistered, were not recognized in canon law as religious. Precisely because it was thought that real religious required cloister. In 1900, Pope Leo XIII, in an apostolic constitution, which is an official document, entitled Condite a Cristo, recognized sisters in apostolic congregations as genuine religious, as true religious. Until Vatican II, canon law concerning cloistered religious or nuns continued to insist on an extremely rigid form of cloister. But since the council, many orders of nuns have greatly modified the requirements of cloister in order to be more available in the church's life and ministry. So by movement from both directions, as it were, the distinctions between nuns and sisters has ceased to be very significant to most people both to those who are dealing with sisters and to sisters and nuns themselves. And that's, that counts for the interchangeability of the language. There are technical differences, but they don't make a lot of waves in the lives of the people concerned. The big difference most people are aware of is that there are some religious, like for example most Carmelites, who pretty much live and work in their own monasteries and do not move from one monastery to another. Whereas sisters, like you might know Mercy Sisters or Sisters of Charity, do engage in a wide variety of ministries, often outside their own houses, have extensive and intensive relationships with people who are not religious, and are quite mobile, living in various types of local communities, sometimes even intercongregationally or individually, all the while retaining active and committed membership in their own congregation. Sisters in general probably prefer the term religious when they're being spoken about, and sister or their baptismal name when they're being spoken to. Because they prefer not to be thought of as cloistered, and because sister or their own name captures their self-understanding of their egalitarian and effective, affective relationships among themselves, with sisters in other orders, and with their lay contacts, including family, friends, fellow Catholics, co-ministers, and all people of goodwill. So technically, canonically, the term nun and order and cloister uh, belong together. That's one side of it. Sister, congregation, and the notion of non-cloistered mobility and ministry are the other group. Community is the context of the life of both, and religious is the broad canonical designation that covers both groups. Sometimes you hear a, a term that arose quite recently and is, I think, not very helpful in a lot of ways. Uh, you hear a reference to consecrated life. This is a vaguer, looser term, difficult to pin down canonically, and as I say, not more conducive to confusion, I think, than clarity. So that's the easy misconception or confusion to handle because it is in our time largely canonical and doesn't have much impact on the sisters or nuns themselves or the people with whom they interact. Although it's an important consideration when someone is discerning whether she wants to enter religious life and if so, what kind of religious life she wants to enter. A more serious misconception, much less common today than it was 50 years ago, bears on the question of why a young woman might choose to become a religious. Some people still suspect that people enter the convent, was the expression we used to use, that is, they become religious out of fear of or incapacity for life in the real world. 
or from fear of or disdain for marriage, or just because no suitable marriage partner was available. <laughs> you heard this often. Whatever was true in the past, such motives would be recognized today during the formation period, and the person in question would be guided towards some other way of life. Furthermore, women in first world cultures have many vocational and lifestyle choices today that they didn't have 50 years ago. Young women are not expected to be married or in the convent, that is safely under non-parental male guardianship, within a few months of high school graduation, as was generally the case even until the mid 20th century. Young women today expect to go to college and or choose their own careers, to be financially independent if they so choose, and to decide if and whom and when to marry. And whether we think it good or bad, marriage is no longer considered in our society, even increasingly among Catholics, as the sole context of sexual activity or relationships. So marriage, the nunnery, or being an old maid are not the only viable options in the minds of most young people today. And that was the case previously, before a girl married in the convent or an old maid exhausted the <laughs> possibilities. A third misconception, more common in developing cultures than in cultures like ours, is that religious life offers a woman opportunities not available to women who marry. For example, higher education, a middle class lifestyle, the opportunity to exercise a profession or leadership, not open to women whose culture restricts women to marriage and children. This was undoubtedly, there was undoubtedly some of this kind of upward mobility mo motivation operative, at least subconsciously, and even in countries like ours, in the choice of religious life a half century ago. But today, especially in cultures, in developed cultures, women looking at religious life are more likely to see it as curtailing their financial, professional, and academic opportunities than enhancing them. Most women who enter religious life in this country today come from already launched, if not established, professions or careers rather than in search of professions and careers. And that has something to do with the number of people entering and not entering. A fourth misconception is that religious life is a choice of a higher form of life whether a quasi-hierarchical or clerical position in the church or a superior kind of sanctity. There might have been some basis for this misconception in times past, especially when the church was rigidly hierarchized with the pope and the bishops at the top of a pyramid, uh, priests under them, religious beneath the priests, and the laity below the religious. In this imagination of the church, which Vatican II called into question, and contemporary ecclesiology does not really support, religious were in a kind of intermediate state, lower than the ordained but superior to the laity. And this misconception was reinforced by the fact that sisters were associated, informally but really, with some church ministries from which the ordinary laity were excluded, such as teaching in Catholic schools, informal and non-sacramental spiritual counseling, or preparing children for the sacraments. Vatican II rejected this understanding of religious life as a higher state of life in the church, firmly declaring that all the baptized are equally called to ministry in the one body of Christ and to one and the same holiness. In fact, of course, as Francis keeps reminding us, the sin of clericalism or the attribution of superiority to the ordained and their attempt, that is the clergy's attempt, to use such attributed status for personal gain as entitlement or as a power base in relation to the laity remains virulent in the church. And Francis speaks out against this again and again. But at least women religious are not, generally speaking, adherents of that heresy. Whatever religious or others think on the subject, religious life is not a superior life form in the church. And religious are not superior to others in the church, spiritually or ministerially. There is difference between matrimony, religious life, and the single life, but it's not a hierarchical difference. And there is a difference in function between the ordained and the lay. 
But in any case, religious life as religious is a lay, not a clerical state. So anyone entering religious life today for status or power, whether hierarchical or spiritual, is deluded. <laughs> in fact, as well as in theory. And will not find much encouragement of her elitist pretensions in the life, as it's understood today. A fifth misconception about nuns, held largely by some of the hierarchy, and probably a fair percentage of laity who are not religious, is that religious are agents of the institutional church. Or worse, a cheap workforce for the hierarchy. <laughs> there certainly was something accurate, not theologically, but practically, in that perception in times past. Religious, especially women religious, did run the schools, healthcare facilities, and social services that the church in its, get, in its ghetto days, before the council, felt it needed, why did it need it? To supply certain services for Catholics who either could not obtain or whose faith would have been endangered by making use of such professional services supplied by non-Catholic agencies. Hence, the church needed Catholic schools from kindergarten through university, Catholic hospitals and Catholic social agencies, Catholic social clubs where Catholics would meet other Catholics as potential spouses and produce little Catholics, <laughs> service corps and employment groups and boy and girl scout troops, sometimes even Catholic credit unions and so on. This Catholic parallel track in American society died quickly in the aftermath of the council and the election in 1960 of the first Catholic president. Today, for the most part, sisters do not minister exclusively in parishes or diocesan-run services, and if they do, they do so on their own terms, according to the charisms, that is the spiritual genius, of their own congregations, missioned by their own superiors, and they are paid for their services rather than being part of a quasi-barter system in the Catholic ghetto. The name for the ghetto was parishes. But <laughs> I, I, I'm talking sociologically now. The parish was, in fact, a closed socio-economic, political, often ethnic, um, social organization. And so it needed all its services supplied from within. Uh, and that, uh, that is what collapsed, really, beginning with the election of Kennedy and ending, uh, being completed, <laughs> the dissolution of the ghetto, pretty much by the uh, close of the council. Uh, sisters are often still not paid adequately, nor accorded just working conditions when they minister in Catholic institutions under the control of the hierarchy, but they are no longer effectively a servant class in a clerical power structure. That misconception needs to be laid to rest. The legitimate autonomy religious ha has been difficult for some of the hierarchy and clergy to accept and has been seen at times, including by uh, laity, as insubordination or even disobedience on the part of the sisters. This perception certainly played a part in the launching of the apostolic visitation. In fact, the preconciliar situation in which sisters were effectively a poorly or even unpaid workforce for the clergy, charged with enforcing unquestioningly the official positions of the hierarchy, especially in moral matters, was the real anomaly. That was the anomaly, not the current situation. It was historically understandable in light of the endangered position of Catholics in pre-1960s America in an indifferent and often hostile civil and social environment. But it was not theologically justified. Religious are not substitute many or wannabe clerics, nor official agents of the church as institution, much less enforcers. During the Vatican investigation of U.S. religious congregations, some lay defenders of the investigation sometimes use the analogy of a franchise to legitimate the invasion of the privacy and autonomy of religious by the investigators. In the view of these defenders of the Vatican, 
The sisters had no more right or reason to object to an unannounced, surprised invasion of their lives by a team of Vatican investigators than a McDonald's franchise had to object to a surprise quality control investigation by headquarters. So if McDonald's has a right to see whether your sack of french fries weighs exactly the same as every other sack of french fries in the McDonald's system, the Vatican had a right to see whether every sister behaved exactly the way every other sister was <laughs> supposed to behave. This notion of the franchise, that, that religious orders were franchises of the Vatican. They were, in other words, voicing precisely this misunderstanding of the role of religious in the church. Religious orders are not founded by the hierarchy. They do not derive their ministries from the hierarchy. They are not paid or supported by the hierarchy, in this respect, unlike priests. Hmm? They are not branch offices of the Vatican, nor Father's little helpers. <laughs> nor are they blind or unquestioning enforcers of church order and discipline. The long arm, as it were, the official cops of hierarchical power. One of the unintended positive results of the Vatican investigations is that sisters and laity, and one would hope the hierarchy, developed a clearer realization of the identity, role in the church, and legitimate autonomy of religious life as a state of life in the church, and the, <coughs> and the right of religious to self-determination in the framing and living of their lives. So, this brings us to the heart of our inquiry. If religious are not people in flight from the world, or marriage, or poverty, or personal responsibility, or professional exclusion, or occupational failure, if they're not seeking a superior status in relation to the rest of the church's laity, if they are not wannabe priests, or an intermediary class between clergy and laity in the stratified church, if they are not a cheap labor force for the ordained or branch offices of the Vatican, what exactly are they? <laughs> and our question tonight, what are they really up to? I'll take up this question from two directions. First, more briefly, from the standpoint of the individual who becomes a religious, and then from the standpoint of religious life as a life form in the church. In other words, from the personal and the social angles. So first, from the personal standpoint, the first thing sisters are up to is the living of their vocation as religious, being religious. That's the first thing they're up to. Religious life used to be called a state in life, analogous to matrimony, which was constituted by the mutual commitment of the partners to permanent, monogamous, and faithful love of one another and openness to having and raising children. So the, there were these two states of life in the church. I suggested in my, writing, <laughs> in my writing on this subject that state of life, while it's quite accurate and canonically correct, might carry too many connotations of something static and immobile, a non-living entity like a stone or an architectural construction. I find the term life form a more dynamic way of talking about religious life. A life form that is a term borrowed from the biological sphere, such as plants and animals, carries the same meaning as state in life in that it connotes stability, endurance, purpose, which is particular to that life form, but it also suggests growth, development, mutual modifying interaction between the life form and its environment. Neither the life itself nor the individual living it is static, uniform, or collective. This has probably never been as obvious as it is now in the experience of religious life in the last 60 or 70 years. When older religious today look at what they live today in relation, in relation to what they entered several decades ago, they find it as hard to recognize any element of the life that has not changed enormously as it is to see the continuity between a year old child and that person 50, 60, or 70 years later. They are indeed the same person, but everything is different. And that identity, though enorm through enormous and profound change, is exactly what characterizes a life form as opposed to a state of life. 
Authentic religious life begins not in the personal initiative of someone who has considered her options and decided that religious life is the best deal on offer, but in the experience of personal vocation. The term vocation, of course, comes from the Latin for to call and suggests that the impulse to undertake this life does not originate with oneself, but comes from another, specifically from God, from Christ, even if often through the needs, example, or encouragement of others. I do not call myself to dinner or call myself up on the phone. Someone else initiates and I respond or decline to respond. But vocation is usually experienced not so much as a call from without, although things like the needs of other people might play a major role in one's attraction to the life, but an interior impulse originating or at least deeply rooted in one's own talents, inclinations, relationships, and so on, but not caused by these personal traits. Very few religious would probably talk about some cataclysmic moment when they were called to the life by a quasi-exterior quasi voice from heaven. Nevertheless, the theological category of vocation denotes a call from God, something one cannot simply choose or, or originate in oneself. And some classical vocations that we read about in the history of spirituality, like that of St. Augustine or St. Francis of Assisi, are presented as bursting into the person's life, not only from the outside, but even contrary to one's inclinations, desires, sense of self. But both aspects of vocation, its exteriority or origin outside oneself, and its interiority or rootedness in the person's own qualities and disposition are important. There is a mutuality between vocation as call and vocation as response. There is certainly nothing to preclude God's calling a person to a state in life and or a ministry precisely through their own natural inclinations. The influence of persons to whom they are attracted. Their affinity for particular forms of service. Their inborn talents or learned skills. Or more likely a combination of these factors. Indeed, this seems to be the usual mode of vocation. But the point of the term vocation, rather than simply choice or option, is that what is important is not how the call occurs, but whether it actually is from God. What God desires for and from this person. Is this state of life or life form in which this person, is this the state of life in which this person will become what she was created to be and to do? Just as adults undertaking the path to baptism or entering into sacramental marriage must discern whether they're called by God to Christianity or to matrimony and not simply by good experiences in the Christian community or good feelings toward the prospective partner. The, the prospective religious must discern whether, at the deepest level, God is calling her to a life that is by any measure demanding and not natural in the sense of built into the ordinary processes of human maturation. To undertake lifelong consecrated celibacy, which is fundamentally a positive choice about the kind of love one experiences from God and toward God, involves the surrender of real goods, namely marriage and parenthood. It is not the natural path for adult humans. The choice of this non-natural, and I'm not saying unnatural, but non-natural way of life has to be based on something very fundamental. That something being the divine invitation to place one's God-given power of generative love and procreation, as well as all one's possessions and even one's freedom in the service of God and God's people, to the exclusion of any other primary life commitment in this very distinctive way. Consecrated celibacy is the defining choice that constitutes religious life, as affective and effective monogamy is the defining choice that grounds marriage. So the vocation to it has to be genuine and the response free and joyful and unconditional. 
As we will see, the other two constitutive choices, which together with consecrated celibacy structure religious life, namely gospel poverty and prophetic obedience, are also extremely important for the entire project. But celibacy, because it really determines what one will do with one's heart over the entirety of one's life, is central. The life will be lived in community and expressed in ministry, as married life will be lived in the relational context of the family and expressed in the promotion of the life of all the members of the family. But it remains, first and foremost, the incarnation of a single-hearted love, the love of Christ. So we can answer the question in the title of this talk that response to personal vocation is the most fundamental thing that religious are up to. The process of vocational discernment begins when the person first decides to inquire about religious life, and if the person and the congregation decide that there's something genuine enough to merit deeper inquiry and discernment, the person enters into, form, into the formation process or the novitiate. And incidentally, novitiate is a place, a program, a process. It's not a person. Sometimes you hear people say, well, she became a novitiate. No. <laughs> No, uh, she entered the novitiate and became a novice, okay? Uh, and that usually lasts at least two years before the candidate makes the first profession of vows, usually for three to five years, which might then be further extended if necessary until the person and the congregation definitively decide that the vocation is genuine and the response is truly free. Then the person makes perpetual profession of the evangelical councils of celibacy, poverty, and obedience, and becomes a religious in the full sense of the word. This lengthy process of discerning the validity of the call to religious life goes on in the dead of winter as well as in the freshness of springtime, in experiences of exciting newness and of boring sameness, when the person is feeling great and when she's under the weather, when prayer is deeply enriching and ministry challenging and rewarding, and when prayer is marked with darkness and ministry with disappointment and failure, with agree agreeable companions and people one can't stand. <laughs> In interesting employments and drudgery, so that by the time the person is ready for perpetual profession, there is little ahead of her that she has not had some taste of before she makes profession. What is finally being tested is not how one handles what life raises up, but the deepest orientation and desires of the heart, which enable a person finally to cope with whatever arises in the increasingly long lives that people today lead. Religious life in its fullness is initiated by the act of profession. Because of its similarity in some ways to marriage, and the rather strange times upon which marriage in first world countries has fallen, it's well at this point to say something about what theologically religious profession is and entails. <coughs> profession is what makes a person a religious, and it shapes everything the person does as a religious. Hence, it is in a very deep sense what religious are up to, namely living the profession that they make. Religious profession is perpetual commitment to God to the exclusion of all other primary life commitments by public vows in the church. Profession is not only temporally or factually or ideally lifelong, which might be connoted by the term permanent, but qualitatively total, that is perpetual. Its lifelong quality is the temporal dimension of its qualitative absoluteness and totality, just as celibacy is the relational dimension. People often ask whether it might not make sense, as well as increasing the number of people who would enter religious life, if people could make a limited time commitment. That is, to be a religious for a period of time, at the end of which they would be free to leave for some other life form and kind of work or ministry. This question reflects a real and understandable but rather complete misunderstanding of the nature of religious life. Being a religious is not something one does, but something one becomes. Just as one cannot get married for a time or become a parent for a specified period, 
One cannot become a religious on a part-time basis or for a specified time period. This is not to say that commitments, which are by their very nature perpetual, can, cannot, for various reasons, which may or may not carry the connotation of culpability, end. We know that some do. People get divorced. Religious leave religious life. But such commitments cannot validly start out anticipating termination or expiration. Because they are not jobs or projects undertaken, but rather ways of being and becoming, it is self-contradictory to undertake them without the intention of perpetuity. In first world culture, this is a difficult concept for many young people, and older ones for that matter, to process. One of the, one of the things, therefore, that nuns are really up to is living in the church and world the true meaning and real possibility of perpetual, total, personal life commitment, fidelity with the entirety of one's life, that is, the possibility of life itself as love. Most young people growing up today do not live in a cultural context in which perpetual commitment, lifelong fidelity, through good times and bad, is a natural, even if very challenging, expression of human and spiritual maturity. Part of what Francis has called our throwaway culture in which he challenges in profoundly compassionate but very demanding ways in his apostolic exhortation on marriage and the family, re just recently published, Amoris Laetitia, is our cultural instinctive provisionalism, our conviction that life commitments mean not no matter what until death, but as long as this works for me. Religious formation for perpetual commitment entails confronting this cultural baggage this conviction that unconditional, lifelong self-commitment is not really possible or even rational, or at least that it is not to be expected, and certainly that it is not to be required at the outset of a life, whether marriage or religious life. Perpetual commitment is intrinsic to religious life, part of what its adherents are really up to. And finally, we come to what religious are up to in church and society, that is, to the social dimension of the life. And this is where religious life becomes a very public venture in the church and the world. And therefore, where conflict is most likely to touch religious, their congregations, their leaders, and their ministries. The church, from its inception in the resurrection of Jesus, is an extroverted reality. The risen Jesus commissioned his Easter disciples to go into the whole world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Christianity has never been an enclave of the perfect, a Gnostic group of people privately pursuing their own holiness or even their own salvation. Jesus came as agent of God who not only created the world and its human inhabitants, but who so loved the world that even after its rejection of God, God did not reject it, but gave God's only son not to condemn the world, but the, that the world might be saved through him. We cannot discuss this whole cosmic plan of God and its carrying out in Christ, and then through his disciples, but to understand what religious life is really all about, we have to start with this divine project, the salvation of the world. Religious life, regardless of <coughs> what a particular order was, as we sometimes erroneously say, founded to do, such as teaching or nursing, or what its current members actually do in ministry, is a life form in the church that attempts to realize, that is to make real, in this world, God's plan for the world's salvation. That is what all religious congregations have in common, no matter how ministerially they contribute to that great project. And that is the real explanation why all religious congregations make the same vows, namely consecrated celibacy, gospel poverty, and prophetic obedience. Let me say just a little about what these vows are and are not about as a basis for further discussion, if you wish, later, and how they contribute to God's great work of saving the world. Essentially, human beings are laced into creation along three axes, relationships, material goods, 
and power. First, no human can live in total affective isolation from other people. Even newborn infants, they tell us, even if they are physically well cared for, if they are not affectively nourished, if they're not loved, they will not thrive. They just die. And our need for meaningful connection with other human beings only increases as we mature, until we're ready to make commitments of various kinds to our fellow human beings and participate in propagating the race. Second, we cannot live without the support of material goods, air, water, food, and then all the other material supports of our creaturely existence. And thirdly, we need to give direction, purpose to our lives and help shape the reality in which we live through the exercise of personal power, our freedom to choose, to create, to achieve, to become. These three fundamental needs determine how we use our basic capacities, affectivity, power, and possession. As we well know, these three axes of human existence, often referred to in our society by the somewhat cynical shorthand of sex, money, and power, are the foci of our most important life choices. And what we do with our capacity to love, our desire to possess, and our drive to act freely determine what kind of persons we become, the quality of our contribution to or destruction of our world and our fellow human beings, and our ultimate destiny as persons and as a race. I think we saw diverse positions on this illustrated last night in living color. But these basic drives, these fundamental powers, these potential obsessions for love, possessions, and power are also the sinkholes into which all humans and all societies are potentially drawn to their own destruction. What we do as individuals, as societies, as a human race, with these three dimensions of our human existence, determine not only the quality of our personal lives, the direction of history, but in the long run, the salvation of the world. If we look at the story of the temptation of Jesus in the desert, at the very inauguration of his saving work, we see Jesus, the one through whom God reached out to save the world, at the very out, uh, outset of his messianic career, tempted by the one that John's Gospel calls the prince of this world, Satan. Jesus is tempted to repudiate his divine vocation of mediating the return of humanity to God, from whom it had been estranged by the perversion of desire in the Garden of Eden, and join ranks with the agent of evil, the devil, for the destruction of the world. The three temptations are presented in the gospel as symbols of the world, the flesh, and the devil, or the temptation to pervert the human dynamics of possessions, relationships, and power by putting them in the service of one's own private well-being rather than in the service of God's design and the common human good. The gospels present Jesus as repudiating Satan's temptations and setting out on his mission of saving the world by preaching and bringing about the reign of God in this world. The reign of God that Jesus preached is not a geographical place or a political regime. It is an imaginative reality construction, which Jesus describes in his parables that usually begin, the reign of God is like. And he proleptically and symbolically actually realizes this new order through his miracles of healing and life-giving and his creation of a new family of sisters and brothers, which is not based on blood, in which there's no hierarchy, no abuse of power, no inequality, no violence. But Jesus' opponents, under the influence of the prince of this world, know what he is doing. Know that he is ushering in a new vision of human life that will displace the going system. He is prophetically seeding the people's imagination with a new reality construction, what he called the reign of God, which would be the end of the system in which sexual dominance, economic exploitation, and abuse of power create a world of oppression of the weak by the strong, the poor by the rich, women and children by powerful males. Jesus was inaugurating the reign of God. 
This is the real reason Jesus was executed. He was bringing to an end the world order, the world construction, the reign of Satan, and inaugurating the reign of God. In a nutshell, that is what the church, the body of Christ, continuing Jesus' mission in this world is supposed to be all about. The church is supposed to be the realization in time and space of the reign of God. This is what Francis is so passionately trying to get people to see. The church is not a political power, an economic system, a moral police force, a thought controller. The church is not sent to ferret out sins, convict the offenders, punish the guilty, and keep good order until the last judgment. The church is to be the Good Samaritan, binding up wounds regardless of how they were incurred or who the wounded is. The church is to be the mother hen gathering into one all the scattered children of God, the good shepherd seeking the lost sheep. The church is to be the physician who cares for the sick, not the well. The householder sweeping her home in search of the lost coin. The baker woman leavening the dough of humanity with the word of God. The prodigal parent welcoming back the good, bad child and the bad, good child. Because to a true parent, there's only the child. What religious life is really all about is constructing in this world of space and time an earthly realization of the reign of God. They do this by creating a world, the world they choose to live in, through the public profession and living of the three symbolic and inclusive vows they make. By their vow of consecrated celibacy, religious fix their hearts on God to the exclusion of any other primary and exclusive life commitment, even the most beautiful commitment to one's own spouse and children, thereby anticipating the universality and love of the reign of God in all its fullness. By their vow of evangelical poverty, religious renounce all possession and choose to live a life of total possessionlessness in community. This possessionlessness is not penury or destitution, but a holding of all things in common in order to create and realize and model a world devoid of private property, which divides people into haves and have-nots. By their vow of poverty, they create a gift economy in which all contribute according to their ability and receive according to their need. By their vow of prophetic obedience, religious commit themselves to a moment-by-moment -moment quest for the will of God to the exclusion of all power relationships, whether as dominators or as dominated. They choose to live together in a community of equals that already anticipates and establishes the reign of God in this world. Religious life, in other words, is the construction of an alternate world. The reign of God right here and now in historical time and space as Jesus did by his celibate, possessionless, homeless life with his band of itinerant disciples. So when religious life, what religious life is not is a service organization or a task force or a club of like-minded people or a political party or a professional network or a corporation, or even a substitute family. And it is certainly not a police force ensuring good ecclesiastical order. It is a concrete sociological realization in the here and now of the reign of God in this world. It constitutes a concrete historical challenge to Satan's reality construction <clears throat> and an affirmation of the faith-based certainty that the reality construction of Jesus of the reign of God is already present in this world and will eventually triumph over Satan's project. Religious life is an attempt to live the salvation Jesus came to inaugurate in the here and now as a visible assurance that in the end, as Julian of Norwich says, all will be well because God's reign will come in all its fullness. This is the reason religious life is often enough a sign of hope to the people who are at the bottom of the heap whether marginalized by a society that has little interest in the poor, the sick, the uneducated, the orphan, the victimized, the offender, the differently abled or gendered or oriented, or by an institutional church that is sometimes more concerned about its rules, its place in society, 
its structure of gender-based power and privilege, its image of sinlessness, than about the people it is supposed to be serving. Francis is saying this over and over. And so it is not surprising that religious are often enough at odds with the systems and structures, both secular and ecclesiastical, that one would think would be most of like mind. This is also the reason why wherever there is violence, injustice, suffering, exploitation, poverty, ignorance, you will find religious ministering to the victims. Today, religious are especially concerned with the spiritual thirst of so many seekers who are not finding meaning in their societies. With a battered and threatened natural universe that is less and less able to nurture life, precisely because of the rapaciousness of those who already have more than they need and are unconcerned by those who lack even the necessities of life. With the violence in and among societies which have made private possession a god. So you find religious and spiritual ministries, education, ecological projects, social justice work, ministry in inner cities and under, underdeveloped cultures, and so on. This is not just philanthropy or even idealism or altruism. It is the acting out of the basic commitment of religious to the coming and flourishing of God's reign. And that is why they cannot, as some religious romantics desire, swish around in archaic clothes, hide out in sacred spaces, immune from suffering and struggle, and represent a world that does not yet exist. They are in and for the world as Jesus was, and because Jesus was. Now, there's no question that religious life is a utopian project. And utopian projects, precisely because they are utopian, often drive the realists and the cynics to despair. An exasperation that can turn deadly, as it did in the case of Jesus. And precisely because utopian projects are utopian, their adherents often fall short of their goals. And their failure is often enough more public and potentially more scandalous because of the public nature of their ideals. But neither persecution nor failure is a reason for despair. And it should not suggest that only cynics are realists. Persecution is the, unintended, is the unintended recognition that prophecy is indeed at work. And failure is simply an incentive to continual repentance and revisioning and recommitment, as well as a guard against complacency. So what are the nuns really up to? They are up to the coming of the reign of God in the present, in the here and now, in this time and place, through the preaching of the good news by their life, individual and communitarian, in season and out of season, using words, as Francis of Assisi said, when necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That was a meditation and a challenge and an exposition that was beautiful. And I know like many of us in this room, uh, I had the benefit of having many wonderful religious in my life, sisters of St. Joseph and St. Francis and Dominicans and Mary Newell and medical mission sisters. I can think of so many. So I think you hit on the fact of the way of life is uh, not in the service element uh, incorporated therein, but not, uh, but, but only is incorporated therein within the vocation. But what do you say today, uh, going back to your initial 
uh, other book there about to the nuns, mm. uh, about how does this play out for the millennials, uh, for my kids, and for so many in this room and others. How, uh, how, I guess, other than living your life authentically, uh, what else uh, is a way of communicating and appreciating their own spiritual quest and and uh, giving them the example of which many of us in the uh, over 50 age group experienced. Why don't we start with the simple questions? <laughs> no, I, this, I, I'm sure this, this question is, is present to all of us. And probably to those of us over a certain age, uh, it, it looks particularly unanswerable because we grew up at a time, we, we grew up in the ghetto. And in the ghetto, so many things were self-evident. And choices were quite limited. Uh, and role models were everywhere. Uh, so in that closed environment, um, young people, uh, they witnessed commitment. I mean, for many of us, uh, knowing anybody who was divorced was shocking. Nobody was divorced. Catholics didn't divorce. I remember my brother saying when his youngest daughter came home from school one day and said, you know, you and mom are the only parents of anybody in my class who aren't divorced. And Paul said, what do you mean? That's absurd. And he said, and then I checked it out. And actually, she was the only child of an intact family in her class in grade school. Um, and so today, people are growing up in an absolutely different world. Uh, and our longing that we could recapture that ghetto experience is entirely understandable. I'm not so sure that if we were really given the choice of it that we would choose it. Because we know how circumstantial a great deal of that fidelity and that, I, you know, that ideal of life and so on. Uh, the, the fact that you know, a fourth of every high school graduating class trooped off to the novitiate. You know, to make a lifelong commitment to consecrated celibacy, you know. Obviously, uh, if, that, if that were the normal state of affairs, there wouldn't be any children for the next generation. Uh, uh, but because this happened so suddenly, because the, the dissolution of the ghetto happened so suddenly, there was no transition. You know, we, we didn't molt gradually into what we're dealing with now. Within one generation, a world came to an end, and another not well-organized world emerged. And that's what we're dealing with right now. And so, you know, when we ask the question, well, how can we recapture this? And why are there so few nuns? And how can kids who've never met nuns know about this life? And the, I think your most important question, uh, how do we meet and engage uh, the question about meaningfulness in life of people growing up today. Because it's not absent. It's not that they, they don't care, they just want to eat, drink, and be merry, and, and you know, let the chips fall where they will. There's a profound quest among young people for meaning. And they look all over for it in, in very destructive environments. Uh, and in all kinds of experiments in community living, in volunteer work, in spiritual practices, in uh, almost anything that comes down the pike that offers something of meaning, you will find young people very interested in. They don't want a meaningless life. Uh, they have had more exposure to consumerism by the time they're eight or nine than most young Catholics had by the time they were 35. And this is just a generation ago. This is not the Middle Ages. Uh, so one of our big questions is precisely how do we meet young people where they are, not where we'd like them to be? How do we really hear their questions? And what can we offer them? And I think we really can't offer them anything except their lives. You know, you can tell people about what the good life is, you can tell them what commitment means and so on, but if the adults that they deal with 
don't model that and don't know what they're doing. <laughs> don't know what they're doing. Are not able to articulate why they've made the choices they've made and why they're happy in the choices that they've made. Because they want not only meaning, but they want happiness. And that is a legitimate, God-given quest. <laughs> They don't want, they don't even want meaning at the, course, at the cost of unhappiness. But they don't mean by happiness and unhappiness anything different than, than we did. They're not talking about pleasure. They're not talking about being entertained endlessly. They're not talking about, many are far more uninterested in material acquisitions than we might have been. Uh, so. Uh, we're, we're dealing with really a, a, a very, very challenging situation with our young people, and they're not growing up in a ghetto situation. So we've got, we've got to find a way to listen to them. But before we can even listen to them, we have to be able to live a life that they can look at and say, whatever that is, I want to find something like that. I echo Dave's great gratitude for the women religious in my own life, and, um, and thank you again for your, your words. Uh, you know, Sandra, once uh, Karl Rahner was famous for saying, the future of the church will require us to become mystics, or it will cease to exist. As a follow-up to this, you, you speak about the importance of the witness of our lives, and what and how we share. I'm curious about the responsibility that you see for religious to talk about our contemplative experience and to make that more accessible to young people. My experience is that that's where the conversation has to begin, with experience. Mm -hmm. And a shared experience often is such a great foundation. So mm -hmm. I'm curious what your thoughts are about mm -hmm. making that more available. Well, I, I agree with you completely. Uh, uh, people who are seeking depth of meaning in their lives know that whether you call it mysticism or contemplation or a spiritual practice or whatever, that somehow people are talking about the same thing. I, I think one of our contributions as a faith community, as a Catholic faith community, is that we can put a name on that. We really can talk about the experience of God in Jesus Christ. Uh, but we're unlikely to be able to talk about it unless, number one, we experience it. And you can't fake it. You know, if somebody is trying to talk about married love and they've never experienced it, it ain't going to work. Uh, so if, you're, if we're trying to talk about the love of God, about a genuine experience of God, not just believing that there is a God and that God is this way, but one's actual experience of union with that God, then the experience has to be real. And so the people who are... Uh, engaging in this kind of ministry with young people, their first and most important preparation for ministry and ongoing resourcing of their ministry is certainly their own prayer life. And I think, uh, I think that's one of the things that religious sisters especially have brought to the fore uh, in, uh, in recent years where they've simply stopped and backed up and said, you know, we've done most of the work in the church we found in the schools and the hospitals and we've done so, but you know what has happened to that profound experience of god and then realizing we have to take time for that we have to put energy into that and that is what has happened in the renewal of religious life and that is what has posed problems for a lot of people who thought of religious as a workforce thought of them as producers and so on that that they were actually saying wait a minute the thing, the thing we most have to offer is an existential witness to the reality of the experience of God, and that requires time and cultivation. So I think that is going on particularly uh, among religious, because that's what they do. Um, but I, I think, we, I think we, we're facing a, a, a challenge that, that we haven't come to any kind of... Um, resolution about about how to bridge that communication gap between people who are living this kind of a life because they were brought up in another time and way, and people who would like to have this kind of experience but 
don't even have language for, for, for seeking it, for asking for it. So how do, we, uh, how do we find ourselves at the place where that conversation will take place? How do we learn the lingo? How do we learn the modes of communication? I, I'm talking about the we being the people who know something about this from experience and people who are uh, communicating in a different medium, who are living in a different culture, whose, whose music, whose um, literature and so on is so different. And uh, I think we should cut ourselves a little slack uh, in this sense that the speed with which we move from one entire world to another entire world has been lightning fast in cultural terms. Things that took hundreds of years <laughs> or at least decades and decades and decades to happen in times past, to get from the, from the Middle Ages to modern times. We've gone from modernity to post-modernity in a space of less than 50 years. So I, I think we can't be surprised that this is extremely challenging and that we don't know the answers, but we have to do a lot of sharing about any answer that anybody finds uh, and be willing to talk about it be willing to expose ourselves in the sense of opening our, uh, opening our own experience, <laughs> acknowledging our own questions, uh, dealing with our own weaknesses and shortcomings, rather than posing, as we did once upon a time, this veneer of perfection that said, you know, we've got it all together, we know all the answers, now we'll tell you what to do, and if you don't do it, we'll make you sorry you didn't. Uh, <laughs> That's not going to get anywhere. <coughs> so that's a long way of saying I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> Sister Sandra, I really have enjoyed listening to all of your wisdom. Um, I'm going to make this kind of simple because I feel that it's a question that's been bothering me for a long time. The nuns and sisters that are part of the religious community, they are so awesome and so diversified and so talented and so educated and have so much to offer, have done so much as far as their service in the uh, church. But I feel as though they are underutilized because there's just so much more with all of the body of three quarters of the uh, total number that we speak about that are available. Um, does the Pope or the um, church feel that the nuns cannot be more utilized as far as uh, what the priests are doing. You mentioned about them not wanting to be priests, but do they have a desire to be more focused at a different level, or am I imagining that they uh, need to be there because the numbers are so few? And is this a question that comes up? Because it's something that uh, the, the sisters are um, so humble, and yet they have this amazing spirit and uh, beauty that they can provide because of all the things that they've done in the world that uh, seems to be not um, being used. Is there a time when this is going to happen, or do they not want to be there, or, or is there another body that doesn't want them to be there? Mm -hmm. Um, I, it was your question in your last phrase? <laughs> um, I, I don't know what, uh, what this vast field that they should be utilized in would be. I don't know any idle nuns. <laughs> uh, and I think most of us are working at what we're doing at least, you know, twice a normal <laughs> workload. So uh, I, now if you're referring, should nuns be ordained? I hope to God not. <laughs> Shock. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, well, uh, let, me, let me just put it this way. Uh, there should not be anything in the church that says to anybody, because you're gay, because you're a woman, because you're black, because you're uh, whatever, you cannot participate fully in the sacramental system of the church. I mean, that's simply wrong. Uh, it's theologically wrong. It's humanly wrong. It's sociologically in the church dysfunctional. So there, there should not be anything that says you can take, you know, there's 
seven sacraments for one group, but six sacraments for the other. OK, so wipe that off the table. That's simply wrong. And the sooner we retire it, the better. Uh, but is religious life basically a call to ordained ministry? I think absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons why religious life makes the contribution it does is precisely because its members aren't ordained. Uh, so if somebody were to say to me, uh, do, I want sister, do I want women to be able to be ordained, I would say absolutely yes. Do I want sisters to be ordained? Absolutely no. Uh, and we have a long history in the church of what happens when, unfortunately, office and charismatic vocation get combined institutionally. And it hasn't been a pretty picture for the most part. Uh, it hasn't been a total disaster. But I remember saying to the person who was the most highly placed Benedictine monk in the world at the time, this was quite some time ago, uh, and I said to him, look, um, you know, I, I just, I, ba I basically am glad women religious have not been ordained. And he said, I, and I said, you know, look at your own order. Benedict said, have nothing to do with priests or bishops, <laughs> to his monks. And, and I said, uh, and you went the other direction. And I said, I'm not sure that the history suggests that this is necessarily the only or best choice. And he said, I agree with you completely. Now, this was the highest placed Benedictine in the world who was the head of all of these ordained monks. Uh, and this is not because there's some intrinsic clash, but these are two vocations. One of them to the, the organized leadership headship, and the other to the charismatic service of the people of God. Now, can some people c combine this and make it work? Yes. But once sisters, if sisters were ordained, for example, you would immediately have them not only under the Congregation for Religious and Secular Institutes, and the dogmatic, they'd also be under the curial office uh, for bishops and priests. Uh, if there are some members of a religious congregation who are ordained and others who aren't, you automatically have a two-tiered society in which the ones who aren't ordained, the religious, cannot hold office over the ones who are ordained. Do, do we want that in religious congregations? that kind of division. And you could go down the line, there's a whole bunch of uh, the educational process. You pointed out the education of sisters, which is extremely diverse. They're in all kinds of fields. Uh, but their order of study is not determined by a, a, an end product of being ordained. This is discussed in the first volume of Sister Sandra's uh, trilogy <laughs> on religious life, which is going to be sold out here after the book. <laughs> Uh, it, it was the first time I had read her explanation of why it was problematic to ordain members of religious, women's religious community, and it was counterintuitive to me, but I found it really very persuasive when I... Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you know, I, I think if we could get these two things together, there should not be any proscription of the ordination of women. That is simply wrong. Now, if women could be ordained, then they could, and we're, at a unique, we're in a position that men were not when male orders, which were originally religious, uh, were clericalized by their own, in many cases, by their own decision. But if the ordination of women and women's religious life were two possibilities, then a woman could choose one or the other, depending on whether she was called to ordain ministry, which is the ministry of ordo in the church, of organizing the church and, fun and functioning in its, uh, its administration and carrying on, or whether she's called to religious life. Now, what has happened, unfortunately, historically, is, and I think you're alluding to this, that a number of, many women entered religious life because they couldn't be ordained. And what happened, of course, after Vatican II, was a large number of those women left and went into ministries that were as close to ordination as they could get. Okay? Now, but this comes about because of an unjust situation, which is not allowing women the same freedom to respond to their genuine vocation, whether ordained ministry or religious life, that we allow for men. And that wasn't seen for centuries and centuries. It seemed to be based on God's 
preference for males and so on. But once we realized that that wasn't God speaking, uh, <laughs> and, and, and it's time to withdraw that to correct. In other words, you don't correct a mistake by creating other mistakes. Okay, so that mistake has to be corrected, but it shouldn't be corrected by undermining the genuine character of religious life. Now, could one person actually be called to both of them? Possibly. But it ought to be a clear call to both of them, actually tested and discerned. Not that if you want to be an IHM, you have to be ordained if you want to be a first class IHM. <laughs> Uh, that's the problem that historically has been foisted. So in other words, men have been as much, in, not as much, not anything like as much, but men have been uh, disadvantaged by the exclusion of women from orders as well as women. And so, but we don't correct that by duplicating the bad effects that happened from the first. I, I'm a, a vocation director, and I've, I'm in my 14th year of serving in that capacity. You're remarkably well preserved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a dangerous business. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about the 2002 um, North American Conference on Vocations, in which they um, named two th important pieces that I think need to be continued. One is a preferential option for the young, and the other being creating uh, cultures of vocation, a culture of vocation. And I was thinking of your question, sir, in terms of um, what do we do with young people today? Um, I am a vocation director, but really you are the voc, I, I'm, I'm a functionary. Mm -hmm. I help people who come to us exploring religious life, but parents and grandparents are really the vocation directors today. And teachers. And, and teachers, yes. But I think first in, at home and then as the child moves on to other environments. Mm -hmm. But we don't, I think one of the gaps is we don't help each other see that. And um, in addition to vocations, I help with other sisters coordinate a volunteer program. And so we have children as young as 13 coming and live with us and serve in our ministries and we also have some who live full time with us mm -hmm. and serve for a year. And one of the things we teach our younger members is to say, how do you make God look good today as incarnational people? And I, I've said that to my godson, to his little children. How do you say to them at the kitchen table and when you're having dinner, sharing how you've made God look good today? Because as adults, we don't think about ourselves and what our position is in the world. And I, I feel like you have, you have guided us. Our, we've had a group of 20 of our sisters read your book, books and discuss them and help to grow in that. And I think about the life force. I, I would never be called to ordination. Be, uh, there's no shortage of sisters because it's about a lifestyle, a life form. But we talk about shortages. Mm -hmm. yes. If you think of us as a workforce. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, um, if we keep um, engendering this idea of, of we're all called and we're all meant to have a purpose from the very womb practically, and that whole idea of our baptismal call and keep doing that from the home and wherever we are, there will be no shortages. And I think as a, as a vocation director, then I will be able to encounter people who are uh, thoughtful, who are mindful, who are contemplatives in action, and ready to serve, whether it be as a married person, a single person, or a vowed person. Yes, uh, if everyone in the church were made aware that with baptism comes vocation, and at some point in one's life, one has to discern how that's going to be lived. But uh, we've been, we spent, unfortunately, several centuries basically telling people, the baptized, that they didn't have a vocation. The only people who had vocations were priests and nuns, which accounted for the inflation of numbers, for example, of religious, of many people who shouldn't have been in religious life, uh, and the, the, uh, many people feeling like, I have no, I have no vocation. So how do we uh, communicate that baptism is the first vocation? Yes. 
and what shape you're going to give to that as you get older. Uh, you can't do everything. If I'm going to be religious, I can't be a mother. If I'm going to be a mother, I can't be religious. You know, that we, we need to figure out how to shape it. But if there's no sense of vocation from the beginning, as you're pointing out, if, if the baptismal vocation is not nurtured, is not defined, is not raised up, is not illustrated, then when you come to the second stage, you can't build a second stage when there's no first stage. And there's two ages, too. The 11-year-old and 11th grade are the most significant ages for vocation um, because they're most curious and the most available to something new. Oh, that's the 11s, <laughs> as Pooh Bear would say. It's time for 11s. This is perfect because my question is related. I've been lucky to know a lot of different orders of sisters throughout my life. And it's amazing to me that the orders or the congregations, as to use the right term, that are getting the largest numbers of young women are the sisters that are back to full habits, the Sisters of Life in New York, the Dominicans uh, near Steubenville. Can you comment on why, you know, some of the, and again, the charisms of the orders are all different. And as I said, I've been lucky to know many different sisters, different lifestyles, some who live in community, some who live in their own apartments. Why do you think it's, it, the, there's this tremendous surge among those, what I consider to be more conservative orders of sisters or congregations, and, and literally other groups that get one or two women maybe in their 40s now, and is, I don't think it's bad, but it's, it's striking to me. There's, the Sisters of Life have a, a convent near where I live in, in the Bronx, and I have to tell you, they all look like they're clones they all look like the same girl in the same <laughs> outfit. And uh, again, as somebody who grew up with traditionally dressed sisters, you know, in a way it's almost a romanticism back to the old way. But I find it interesting that that group, and I have to give a plug for the order in my hometown, the Benedictines of Erie, Pennsylvania seem to get a lot of people too. But can you, can you comment on that? Uh, well, there are about 20 comments that are necessary. <laughs> The, the first is that this, this uh, impression that uh, people are flocking into uh, uh, 1900s uh, outfit, uh, congregations and not going to, uh, is simply factually not correct. Because it's about 80% to 20%, 80% renewed sisters and about 20% uh, are kind of reinvented. They're not traditional in the sense that they have any history behind them. Most of them have been founded within almost since Vatican II. But the numbers have re remained quite constant, that about 80% of sisters are in renewed congregations, about 20%. Uh, when people uh, say, well, they had 10 people enter last year, and you say, yes, there's a front door and there's also a back door. You know, I always say, have you noticed that they've had to build a bigger convent? Well, if they haven't, and they're getting 20 people every year, what are they doing with them? Uh, but uh, the, the issue, uh, so I mean, the, just the issue of numbers is factually. Uh, the uh, Leadership Conference of Women Religious, which is the uh, uh, group of major superiors of, uh, generally speaking, renewed orders, uh, represents about 80% of um, US uh, sisters. And the Conference of Major Superiors of Women Religious, which is the superiors of these more uh, conservative groups, are about, represent about 20%. And one of the things that happened at the close of the investigation was uh, the upset, because it was expected that the more conservative group, it's hard to come up with non-judgmental and non-pejorative terms, but of, uh, of those who basically wanted the investigation to take place because they believed that most sisters had gone off the rails. Uh, and they expected that when the investigation took place, they would be raised up as the ideal and the LCWR types would be put in their place and back in their habits and back in their comments and so on. What happened was exactly the reverse. So uh, one of the things we have to do is keep the, the facts straight. Um, 
uh, issues of clothing, for example, and what the religious habit means. Uh, we were having a discussion about this uh, last night with some folks. Uh, clothing is extremely symbolic, as any teenager can tell you. Uh, whether it's what you're wearing in your ears or what you have tattooed on your arms or what, you, what kind of clothes you have on and so on. Uh, and not only is clothing itself symbolic, but the symbolicness of clothing is related to culture. So some things that are symbolic of one thing in one culture are not symbolic of the same thing. Uh, so the symbolism of the habit in the Middle Ages and the symbol of that same outfit in the 21st century could be very, very different. In one case, symbolic of uh, consecration or uh, religious commitment, and another of uh, rejection of the world, rejection of people, rejection of ministry, and so on. So the, the same thing cannot, you can't simply pick something up from one culture and put it down in another and say it means the same thing. It doesn't. It's culturally contextualized. Um, so, uh, and like in our culture, we have to distinguish between what some people call religious garb and other people will call a uniform. Uh, we, we make use of uniforms. The soldiers wear, the military wear uniforms, the police wear uniforms, nurses wear uniforms, and so on. And there's a reason for that. You need to be able to find them. And, the, and you also need to know that they're competent to do a particular thing. Okay, so you don't want nurses acting like policemen or policemen acting like soldiers and so on, unfortunately. But, um, uh, so there are reasons for uniforms. Uh, uh, but for example, one of, the thi one of the things that we, we simply assumed the universal significance of uniforms, but why have so many schools moved away from that? Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily want to standardize children into being one kind of thing, <laughs> even when we want to reduce competition in what they wear. So each of these questions that have to do with the struggle, and this is a struggle within religious life, uh, particularly religious life of women, between these two groups. And it's not, it, it's not, it, it's a one-sided struggle. The smaller group uh, does not permit the participation of the larger group, whereas the larger group has no problem with the participation of the smaller group. So it's, it's not let, that there's this going on among sisters. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a rear guard action on the part of some people who want to preserve a certain form of religious life and don't feel that they can do that unless the other form is more or less brought into line. And that doesn't necessarily follow. We could have room in the church for both. Uh, so how to get a pacific, a peaceful, uh, dialogue going instead of saying, well, is this the real religious life or is this the real religious life? Uh, what God calls people to is, or what they feel that God is calling them to is what they should respond to. Uh, it's not the job of anybody in the church to put anybody else out of business unless they're doing something that's really contrary to the gospel. And really and truly, if, if some order wanted to uh, wear bathing suits as their official garb, if they love God and do God's will, I don't care if they wear bathing suits. Now, I might not think it's the most appropriate attire, but I don't want to make... Especially in this climate. Especially in this climate. Uh, but I don't want to make a federal case out of that. You know, there are things to make a federal case out of, really serious things, but clothing is not one of them. I think this might be a good time to end the formal part of our gathering. There's a reception outside. There are also uh, copies of Sandra's books if you would like to purchase them and have them signed. Uh, she would be happy to sign them for you. But do stick around, have a, have a little refreshment, and continue the conversation. I'd like to thank Sandra for being here. You're welcome.